Hello, welcome or welcome back. My name is Ari, and today is my February wrap up. Not nearly as many books in February as I read in January. It's around like half the amount of books and mostly that's because I read a lot more what's the word I'm looking for? Like intelligent books where things that I wanted to take my time with. I also didn't do the 24-hour reading vlogs every single weekend and I allowed myself to do things other than read on the weekends. That being said, I still read far too many books for my own good, so I am going to try to quickly get through this video and not talk too much. So let's start with statistics. In February I read 25 books. That was 8,145 pages, roughly 326 pages per book or 291 pages per day. Out of those books, the genres I read were mostly fantasy because welcome to my life. Six books were nonfiction, which one of my goals this year was to read 12 nonfiction books and I read half of them in the second month of the year. <laughs> so I think I'm doing well as far as nonfiction goes. Then I read five sci-fi books, two horror novels, one poetry, book. It, w it was a novel in verse, but I'm gonna label it as poetry. Uh, one graphic novel and one thriller. For demographic, I read 22 novels for adults, two for young adults, and one that's a middle grade. For the ownership status of the books, which I still don't like this title, but it's what I keep saying, so I'm just gonna go with it. Um, there were 14 books that were on my own TBR that were like backlog books that I've purchased previous years or purchased previous months. There were three books that I purchased specifically to read this month, so new to me books. Then three of them were for book boxes, four of the books were from the library, and one of them was an ARC. For the authors, 14 books were by female authors and 10 by men and one that's mixed where it had uh, multiple authors of male and female. Some of like, I think one of the female books had multiple authors but they were all female authors so you get it, that's not important. Format, 15 books were physical books. Seven books were ebooks and three of them were audiobooks, which is absurd for me. Usually it's like zero to one audiobook, but I read three whole audiobooks this month. Um, and then star rating. I had two five stars, nine four stars, eleven three stars, three two stars, zero one stars, and is not on the graph, but I did DNF one book. So from here, let's talk about the books. Now, I change up how I talk about books basically every single month. Like sometimes I do them in different categories, whatever. Uh, this month we're going to do it by star rating. So I'm going to start with the DNF and then go to the five stars and then just kind of talk about them in that order. Now some of these books, as always, I will direct you to other videos, but the ones that I haven't really talked about in other videos I will talk about here with you. So let's start with my DNF book, which was Small Silent Things by, there's a hair in there, which was Small Silent Things by Robin Page. This came in a book box, uh, which one? The Introvert's Retreat book box. And this is the second book box I've gotten from Introvert's Retreat. Both of the books were DNFs, which, eh, that's bad because I don't DNF books very often and to DNF two books that's saying something. Why did I DNF this? Let's just say because like the character's behavior is one of the creepiest things that I have ever read in my entire life and not like the good kind of creepy you get with horror novels. This is like the bad kind of creepy where 
I'm uncomfortable. Like, I'm skeeved out. I don't want to be in this situation anymore. Basically, the two main characters that you follow in this book are both um, have PTSD, basically. They have led very traumatic lives. The woman has been raised by a very abusive emotionally and physically mother, and then the man uh, lived through a civil war in Africa. I can't off the top of my head remember which country, so I'm not going to say it and potentially be wrong. And um, he saw some really awful things done to his wife and daughter during the Civil War. So I don't have a problem with any of that. What I do have a problem with is both of these characters deal with their trauma by like turning it into sexual fantasies and like the creepiest ways possible. Like having a panic attack and then like start fondling yourself during the middle of your panic attack and like thinking about other people having sex with you in a non-consensual sense is basically how both of these characters deal with that. And I was just like, no, I don't want to read this anymore. So I DNF'd it. It's going away. The next section, two of the books were in my mid-month wrap-up, so I've already talked about these in a wrap-up video. I will link the mid-month wrap-up up in the cards over there and in the description below, so if you were interested in hearing about why I didn't like either one of these two books, you can go to that video for that instead of me talking for 200 hours. The third two-star was The House of Dyes Drear by Virginia Hamilton, and this is a middle grade horror novel um, about a haunted house on the Underground Railroad. This is like the 1970s, I think is when this was written, so it's contemporary, but this black family moves into this house that was part of the Underground Railroad that was supposedly haunted. Um, there's no ghost in this book, or, or, I mean, there's people who dress up and pretend to be ghosts, but like you don't even get like the barest minimum of like the idea of a haunting in this book for as much as this is supposed to be a ghost story. There's no like weird creaky noises or anything. It is very clear that every ghosty thing is clearly done by a human being, um, which in and of itself was disappointing. This is also like, it, it's too young for me personally. Um, I have an issue with a lot of middle grades where I just, I, it makes me feel old, and the way the parents behave towards the children in this book don't, like, it doesn't feel realistic to me. And I don't know if that's just like a flaw in my reality, where this is a very realistic way for people to treat their kids, and it's just not something that I've experienced so it doesn't feel realistic, or if it's because it's written for children the parents are actually behaving in an unrealistic way. And by unrealistic, it's like, you can't place the age of the protagonist character. His parents will sometimes treat him like he's a six-year-old child and needs like constant supervision, and then sometimes they'll treat him like a 16-year-old who could do everything on his own. Uh, and it was just, it was like a really weird like back and forth by like sometimes the protagonist is going to be treated like adult and sometimes it's going to be treated like a child. And it's all the same character the entire time. Um, this was also like boring. There was like huge chunks of this book where they're just like hanging out in downtown, going to church, that had really nothing to do with a plot. It was just like filler. And it was like, I, I don't care. Um, a lot of the mysteries and plot points didn't seem at all relevant in any way, and I would have liked to see this teach more about like the Underground Railroad or be more of a haunting book. Like either or would have been cool, but mostly it was like a boring contemporary. Good things about this book though is this was written in the 1970s and it is about exclusively black characters, which is so cool to see. I just didn't care for the story enough 
that I was particularly excited about that. But maybe, like, there was nothing really problematic in here, so maybe um, for younger black children seeing themselves in a book that has been around for a very long time would be a very very cool thing. So I think I'm just not the best judge of this book overall, but from my own personal enjoyment level I did not enjoy it very much. Next we're moving to the three stars and to start to the three star I'm going to do my Shannara series of the month because I gave all three of these books three stars. I have an entire vlog where I'm just talking about each one of these books, uh, spoiler filled, everything like that. Um, so if you were interested in getting like in-depth opinion on all of these, then go watch that. Next two three stars I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up, so I will direct you to that video again. The first one was Cast by Isabel Wilkerson, I think is her name. Yep. Which was okay but long-winded. The other one was Miss Subways by David Duchovny. The next three star that I read but have not talked about is Riot Baby by Tochi Omnibuchi. And this one, it was okay. Obviously it's a three star so it wasn't like horrible. But I was... I was confused. It felt like there was two like major like plot points that you were supposed to be paying attention to and they were just like headbutting each other and fighting for the attention. Uh, first off, it's about like the mistreatment of black lives where people of color will receive like punishments for crimes that are so out of proportion to their white counterparts where police will be more like, will arrest people more often in a black community than they will a white community. Like, there's just a higher police presence. You'll have black men sitting in jail for years at a time waiting for a trial because they can't make bail. Because the bail is basically like, if you have enough money, you can get out of jail. If you are poor, then you can't get out of jail. And you see that in this book. Uh, this takes place in like, I, I would say like my lifetime roughly. So kind of modern times, but it, it starts in the early 90s. And the titular character, the Riot Baby, was born on April 26, 1992 in Los Angeles. And there was a huge riot that day because the police who were caught on camera beating the shit out of Rodney King were found or were acquitted of all crimes or found not guilty or some something like that. We see it in the media all the time um, but this was like the first time that it was really caught on camera and there were riots. People were unhappy, there were riots and like this thing it happened in real life but it also happens in this book and like I said the character was born on that day so he was called the riot baby because he was born the day of a riot. It makes sense to me. I hope it makes sense to you. Like the rest of the book just kind of like goes through that black experience of being mistreated in a situation where your white counterpart would not have been mistreated at all but there's also like superpowers. <laughs> Both the Riot Baby character and his older sister have like superpowers. I, I don't know how else to describe it, but they can basically do anything like time travel, fly, teleport, communicate with their minds, all sorts of shit. Um, and then there's also like technology that is being used to like control and test black lives like medical experiments and to control black lives that I hope doesn't actually exist in real life if it does then 
I haven't heard of it, but God only knows what the American government is capable of doing. Anyway, off subject, but like those two themes like clash a lot. So yeah, it was just like the clash of things left me confused. I think it should have stuck to like one or the other. Like if they would have taken out taken out the superpowers and I was just reading a fictional narrative about a black man who was born during a major riot and that he was being held in prison without a trial, that would have been like a extremely interesting story and I think I would have liked it better. But the sci-fi twist to it just confused me. My next three star was The Sorcerer of the Wild Deeps by Kai Ashanti Wilson. And this again had like the clashing element that really kept me from loving the story. Now this is again a fantasy novel that is like a medieval fantasy in a way where there's like no technology. So like swords, spears, uh, bows and arrows, no vehicles, no electricity, no running water. like medieval technology level, but there's magic. So a lot of things can be done like through a magic system instead of with technology. And the characters or like the population of this universe are either descended from gods who have gone back to like their celestial home or they're just standard humans. And the people who are descended from gods are like more powerful and can, can sometimes perform like different kinds of magics. There's magic in here and it's kind of gross too. Like one of the characters can like spit into a wound and it will heal them. That's gross. <laughs> uh, anyway, like the fantasy aspect of it is really cool and the overall story is really cool. What threw me off is the dialogue of the story because while this is a fantasy setting that is reminiscent of North Africa because they're going through the desert into a jungle. They talk in a modern American vernacular, which I don't have any problem with people talking in, a, in any sort of vernacular or have any issues like understanding it or anything like that. Like that's not the problem. It was like the settings of like the actual setting plus the setting in my mind associated with the way they were speaking was like very, very confusing to me. <laughs> Imagine a mage, a powerful godly mage in Africa and he looks at his buddies and goes, y'all just fucked up, didn't ya? <laughs> and I'm just like, that's not how this person talks in my head. <laughs> so yeah, that, that was my issue with that, was just the, the dialogue. The next three star I have is Black Madness, Mad Blackness by Theory Alice Pickens. And uh, this one is a three star and it's kind of my fault that I didn't like it. So this book is about the intersectionality between race and disability specifically in literature, in specifically black people or disabled black people in literature, which is fine, but this is an academic essay and it is dry, 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 dry and so much like academic stuff. This is not like a read for enjoyment. This is a read because you're going to use it as a source to quote in your own academic paper. So my fault for not realizing this was an academic essay when I picked it up. All in all it wasn't like awful and I learned a lot of interesting information. I was just bored the whole time and my mind kept like ooh, ooh shiny colors over there. The next three star that I read was an arc and this was The Conductors by Nicole Glover. Now this book is being advertised everywhere. There is so much being put behind this as far as like marketing, right? 
And I've had this arc for a while. Everybody, I think, has this arc. This was so easy to obtain on NetGalley. This is this is just everywhere. And I've been seeing a couple of reviews in like early February and January where people were like, oh yeah, I had this arc from forever ago. It was okay. I didn't hate it, but I didn't really like it. And you know what? Honestly, that's exactly how I feel about this book. This is a book about two conductors on the Underground Railroad, or former conductors, because this is after the war. And if you were confused what a conductor is, it's somebody who went, who escaped slavery and then went back to help free other slaves. So they ran the Underground Railroad and directed people multiple times, risking their lives. And now that slavery has ended, they have settled in the north and they kind of like solve mysteries. And by solve mysteries, I mean they help solve crimes in like black neighborhoods because the police are assholes and they don't care. Oh, in this particular book, they are solving a murder. Somebody has turned up murdered. Uh, oh, also, there's magic. <laughs> Uh, black people can do a, or people of color, not specifically just black people, but like uh, Hispanics, people from Africa, uh, Native Americans, anybody who has like a tribal community can perform celestial magic, which from what I understood of it, you would use like, uh, what is the word for that? Astrological symbolism? And like draw a Pegasus or draw Ursa Major or draw the symbol of a Capricorn and use that to do magic. Uh, white people also have their own magic which they call sorcery but it's really wizardry because it's just like you learn spells and then you wave a magic wand. Um, sorcery by definition, because it's not like this author has like made up new magic systems. Um, wizardry has a standard definition, sorcery has a standard definition, and the standard definition of sorcery is obtaining powers from like um, enslaving a demon or selling your soul to a magical being or something like that. That's what sorcery is if you look it up in the dictionary in our world. So rant over, it's called sorcery but it's really, really wizardry. <laughs> um, and it, it's, it's a mystery. They're, this wife and husband are solving a crime. Uh, but really it's, it's like a romance, I guess? Like the main plot of the book seems to be a romance between this husband and wife. And it has my least favorite trope of all time, which is the miscommunication trope. Because apparently they got married to each other for propriety's sake when they kept like conducting people on the Underground Railroad because they were spending so much time together in because it was the 1800s and they had to to girl guy need a chaperone they got married but there it wasn't like a love match like she's apparently incapable of loving uh, <laughs> and this entire book is basically her going I think I'm in love with my husband, but I can't tell him because he only married me for the convenience of it and for propriety's sake, and we swore never to fall in love with each other. And I'm just like, I hate it. <laughs> stop. <laughs> Please stop. <laughs> so yeah, so it was like, 
because it's only from her perspective, you don't get the husband's perspective, but it seems pretty obvious that he has been in love with her this entire time, and that she she is the one who has set this, like, we can't be in love with each other's boundaries, and then he's just going with it so he could be married to the woman that he loves. <laughs> and I hate it. <laughs> So the mystery magical background story is interesting enough and I enjoyed that. The romance thing, I, I, I hated it. <laughs> I don't know how many times I could say that I hated it. So it evened out into like a three star between the enjoying the story and the hating the romance. To end out these three stars and get into the four stars, I am going to put my Dritz read for the month on here, and the first book I gave four stars, which I think was entirely for nostalgia's sake, and then the other two books I gave three stars respectively. <sighs> this was boring. It Ari Salvatore seemed like he was put in this box where it's like, this is the story you have to tell, and you can't like deviate outside of these rules. And it was basically like, I am a dungeon master, and this is a campaign that I have worked out, and this is how it's going to go. Uh, and that's how it's told. And it's very dry, it's very formulaic. Um, and I have an entire video on this, so I'm going to direct you to that and shut up. The next three four stars I'm going to talk about, well, I'm not going to talk about them, I'm going to direct you again back to my mid-month wrap-up, and that was Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reed, Wandering in Strange Lands by Morgan Jerkins, and Clap When You Land by Elizabeth Acevedo. From there, I read The Space Between Worlds by Micah Johnson, and I loved this book. This story was so good. This is basically a... you guys know the butterfly effect where like your actions will like affect something else. So like you're at a crossroads and you make a decision here and in an alternate reality you made the other decision. And this infinite decision making splits into infinite possibilities and infinite worlds. And in this world, the uh, some ingenious guy who reads a whole lot like Elon Musk, I guess, uh, invented a way to travel between these realities. And it's based off of like frequencies. And so you'd have to like vibrate somebody's body at a certain frequency and it allows them to trans or to travel to that world. Now you can't travel to infinite universes, you can only travel to ones that are relatively similar to yours, and you have to be dead in that world in order to survive the trip. Uh, because reality can't handle two of the exact same person, apparently. The main character we have in this book has led a life that results in her death in nearly all of these universes. There's like 280 different worlds that she, that can possibly be traveled to, and she's dead in like 270 something of those 280 worlds. So she's led a very rough life. And this just kind of like covers an adventure um, and like the way all of these characters like because all of these worlds are slightly different than hers and how like these characters like interlock and interchange with each other throughout these different worlds where sometimes there's like a major difference but not that major. And it's always like the same people, no matter how their lives turn out, kind of end up in this same circle uh, over and over and over again. And I thought it was really interesting. I very, very much enjoyed the story. It's a great sci-fi. I highly recommend it. Next up is Kindred by Octavia Butler. Uh, but this is the graphic novel. So pictures. Um, this was really cool. I like the graphic novel version of this. I liked looking along with the pictures of it. I think I would rather read this. Like I want to like pick up the novel because I, I feel like I'm gonna like the novel better 
even though I didn't hate the graphic novel, like I still gave it four stars, but I think the novel itself has the potential to be like five stars. This is basically a time travel narrative. This was written in the 1970s, so the modern era is the 1970s, and it's from the perspective of a black woman, and then she time travels back to the time of slavery um, every time this white man's life is threatened. Where it starts out when he's like a young young child and he's drowning and then like continues throughout his teens into his in adulthood and basically any time that he, he's about to die like drowning as a childhood um being beaten up when he got too drunk and started doing stupid shit uh just shit like that there, there's a bunch of different shit and he's not a good person but she keeps having to go back in time and save his life because he is one of her ancestors. He raped a black woman um, who is also one of her ancestors and they had multiple children and one of those children is directly up in her family tree. So basically she has to save this white man because she would have never been born if she doesn't save his life. And so she gets sent back in time and to save him and the only way she can get sent back to the 70s is if she's about to die. Uh, and there's no, like, no explanation about, like, where this comes from, uh, why she's time traveling, why it takes, like, his life being in danger for her to go back in time, or her life being in danger for her to go forward in time. And then, like, a day in the future is, like, a year almost in the past so like the time is not like linear even when she is jumping back and forth so basically she'll end up like I think this takes place in like the 70s over like a month and it takes place like a 30 something years in the past <laughs> So a lot of jumping through time, uh, weird timelines and stuff like that, but the story overall is powerful. It's not good because it's like slavery and rape and horrible shit like that, but it is a very, very powerful story of like, what would you do in that situation? Like, you know this man is a horrible rapist white slave owner, but then you would have never existed if he doesn't exist. It's interesting. I liked it. I mean, I didn't like it, but y you know what I mean. Next up was The Vanishing Half by Brett Bennett, and this was one of my five-star predictions. It was not a five-star, it was a four-star. It was still really good, though. This is about two sisters who grew up in a uh, town of black people after the Civil War, and everybody in that town is a light-skinned black person, but they make it very, very clear that even though they are light-skinned and they act like they're superior, or uppity is the word that they use a lot, that they're, they're better than other black people who have like a darker complexion, they're still... Uh, they're still black. And this takes place in, I don't know, the 70s, I think? Um, maybe. I think it starts in the 50s and goes into, like, the 90s. Maybe. Uh, anyway. So, both of these girls grow up in this town, and they're bored. I mean, small town, in the middle of nowhere. You know everybody? Everybody's up in everybody's business. And when they're, like, 16, they decide to run away and go to New Orleans. Uh, and then get jobs and live their life. And at one point, one of the sisters interviews for a job and she is mistaken for a white woman. And she just, she needs the money, so she doesn't say anything. And she just gets up in the morning and goes to work and pretends to be a white woman when she gets to work and then leaves and then acts like her normal self <laughs> uh, and then has all of her black friends and everything like that so she lives like two polar opposite lives and eventually she kind of just like leaves her twin sister and lives the rest of her life passing as a white woman 
and other character feels like her black heritage is very very important so she finds like the darkest skin black man that she can and marries him and has a daughter and then you kind of like travel through their lives and it is interesting it's a compelling story it doesn't really go the way that you expect it to like you start out with them um and then you follow like the two girls into like their early teens and then you follow their daughters um so like the timeline it's like starts with the two girls then goes into like the life of their daughters and then like there's kind of like flashback stories of to like explain like behaviors and stuff like that that but still taking place in like the 90s whatever it's a very very interesting story it's very good my next four star is Lakewood by Megan Giddings hey I knew that off the top of my head good for me uh, this was a horror novel and Jesus Christ, this was creepy uh, and told in a way that I very, very much appreciated. So basically what this is, is the main character is very, very poor. Her grandmother has cancer and her mother has seizures and uh, migraines and basically her grandmother has been taking care of her and her mother throughout her childhood her mother cannot work because you just can't really keep a job where you're going to like you can't come in like four days of the week because your migraines are so bad or you have a seizure in like the middle of your shift it's it's very hard to like keep down steady non-gig work in that case um and in her case it's like frequent seizures and frequent headaches and so grandmother has been taking care of both of them. She's in college and her grandmother gets cancer and then passes away. And then it's just like, somebody still has to take care of her mother, but she's in college. She has absolutely no money and there's no way for her mother to work. So she takes a sabbatical from college to go back home, move in with her mother, help pay off her mother's and her grandmother's medical bills and like funeral costs and stuff like that. And then like, you know, keep the roof over their head, keep the lights on. And she is so desperate for money, she's willing to do anything. She's like looking for any kind of job. She is willing to take like multiple, like part time jobs because she, she's got no job experience. She's like a sophomore or junior or something like that. So, no job experience. Um, and there's not a whole lot that she can find that she can work with absolutely no experience and no degree. So, she kind of gets this opportunity that's too good to be true where she can sign up to do like medical testing and they pay like three thousand dollars a week and full medical coverage for everyone in her family and there's red flags everywhere like glaring red flags with like these ndas that are illegal and um like you have to give this company like complete like all the passwords to like your social media um the password to your cell phone like all access to like all of your electronic and internet life so they can pretend to be you and like talk to your friends when you're doing these like clinical tests can't tell anybody you're doing them and if you like drop out early or um tell anybody like break your NDA NDA um or like try to go to the police or anything about it like you're you have to pay like a million dollars like first off that NDA is illegal but it's a story so you see the red flags and usually I don't like stories like this because people are just like ignore all of these like huge red flags but this story she realizes them and she's still like even if I die or I'm maimed or something really really bad happens I can take care of my mother <laughs> and you just kind of like follow through these like horrific like body horror like experiences that she goes through in this medical study and it it's gross and creepy and 
even though I would never make these decisions because I have a support system where I would never be that hard up for money, Megan Giddings did such a good job with this book where I could see somebody making these decisions. Uh, a lot of the times I don't understand like why a character is, I don't empathize with why a character would do something. Her writing's so good that I was able to empathize with something that I would never make that just decision on my own, but I was able to understand exactly why she made this decision. So fantastic if you like body horror. If you do not like body horror, I would avoid this book because ew. <laughs> Next up is a fantasy book called The Mask of Mirrors by M. A. Carrick. This is the pen name of two authors who are writing this series together. I don't remember their names and I'm too lazy to look it up. But I got this in a book box. It's like a huge book that I was not planning to read this month, eh, but it was really good. So basically what this story is, is a like heist story. This character is pretending to be like a long lost relative or the daughter of a long lost relative and join this noble family so she can like take all of their money. And, and that's like how the story starts off but then it also like goes into this like political intrigue type thing where this society is driven by like religious differences, uh, where it's like a holy city and the poorer class belongs to the religion where this entire city is a holy site for and then the other class, like the wealthy class, have like won a war and like overtake it everything. Um, and they want to kick all of the people who aren't of their race and religion out of the city and so you've got this like magical politics class war thing going on in here that was just really interesting like this whole book was really interesting with like a very simplistic magic system um it's like a two-part magic system that's based on astrology and like card reading and stuff like that so you can predict like the future based on like star charts or if you are like a powerful enough person through birth like if you have the magic in you you can like read a tarot deck and like predict somebody's future through the tarot deck uh, and it was good uh, it's long it would take me like hours to describe but just trust me it was very good. I did talk about this a little bit more in depth in my unplugged unboxing, so if you want to hear more about that, check it out there. Alright, two books left and they are both five stars. The first one was in my mid-month wrap-up and that was stamped by Jason Reynolds and Ibram X. Kennedy. This is a fantastic look on uh, how black history has been whitewashed. I highly, highly, highly recommend you read this. This is for like a younger audience. There is another novel called Stamped from the Beginning that's just by Ibram X. Kennedy. Um, that was the original novel um, that Jason Reynolds like remixed to make it a more conversational tone because like learning about history at school is boring so make it interesting and that's what Jason Reynolds did in this book. I have not read Stamp from the beginning but I want to but this one is for sure five stars. Highly, 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 highly recommend. My other five star this month was When No One Is Watching by Alyssa Cole and this is a thriller and this is the first thriller I've ever given five stars. This is basically the story of gentrification in a Brooklyn neighborhood, but like murder. <laughs> um, you think it's just basic gentrification and then it gets creepy and I can't, like I can't really tell you much without being a spoiler because it's a thriller, but it's a slow paced thriller. But it's still interesting. Like the thriller aspects are slow paced, but the story overall, like 
I was very constantly interested by the pace and I think I found it so creepy because almost everything in this book I could actually see happening in real life and the thought of like not having the privilege that if I feel threatened I can call the police and the police will help me and the thought of me calling the police and the police being the bad guys in is terrifying and there's so many people in America who have to live with that every single day and that's what makes it terrifying is because it happens like things like this happen where you call the police and they don't do anything about it because of the color of your skin or they'll shoot you instead of the person that is trying to harm you because of the color of your skin um but yeah horrifying in its realism and just overall a very very good story highly recommend if you have not read this yet anyway that is everything sorry that was a lot of long-winded um let me know if you've read any of these or if you decide that you want to pick up one of these books that I talked about and I will see you in the next video. Bye!